Okay, we just started recording now and I'm starting to speak. Uh, so this is the last of the lectures. Um, it was a lot of work for me to prepare these, so I'm glad I don't have still more to give. On the other hand, I'm sorry to end it because there's always so much more to say. Uh, the topic today will, of course, use things from the previous lectures, but it's a little bit different. I'm going a little bit out of the variational analysis book itself and more towards uh, the book that, that Asen Doshev and I wrote together on solution mappings. This is very closely related to issues and optimization and uh, numerical computation, as you will see. <clears throat> so to begin with, uh, let me get rid of uh, I wanted to give you this classical perspective uh, about what a problem is. As I, I started describing the first lecture, for much of the history of mathematics, starting, let's say, with Newton and, and physics, um, a problem was identified with solving an equation. A numerical problem was to solve an equation. Well, what's an equation? It could be a differentiable equa differential equation. There's all kinds of equations. Uh, I'm talking about a finite dimensional uh, framework here. So we're talking about a finite dimensional equation would be basically solving <coughs> for n, n equations and n unknowns. And uh, we represent that by a vector valued mapping from the space Rn to itself. And then that's what we would like to do, find a solution to that. Uh, and uh, <coughs> optimization can be viewed as corresponding to the case where this mapping is a gradient mapping, because then we're looking for where the gradient is zero. Uh, now, of course, uh, classically here, we have n equations and n unknowns, but suppose you had more unknowns and equations, then there would be a solution set that would be, I don't know, some kind of manifold. So as a more general picture, even with equations, there's something more that will enter the discussion uh, later. Uh, but anyway, in this classical issue of n, uh, a situation of n equations and uh, n unknowns, what's important to computation? One of the things that's important to computation is error analysis. Well, what does an error mean? It doesn't necessarily mean just that you didn't compute well enough. It means that you know, need to know how far you are from a solution in order to know when you should stop. So, uh, so. Uh, the basic idea is that there, there may be a solution, x bar, but you don't necessarily know it. Well, maybe you know that it exists, but you haven't found it yet. But you do have um, a, a, uh, a point x at which the, uh, your equation, the residual of your equation is a vector v, which is not zero. If v is zero, I have a solution, but it may not be zero. And the question is, can I use the size of this residual in order to estimate how far I am from, uh, from a solution X? Um, then in this case, as I say, uh, uh, what we could imagine next is we have uh, an equation that depends on parameters. So the solution of this would depend on parameters. And then I would get what I call a solution mapping. But for me, in this context, a solution mapping is something I get when I have a problem depending on parameters and I want to know how the solution or solutions depend on parameters. So in general, this could be a set valued mapping, but it may have what's called a single valued localization. And I will go into that in more detail later. Now in this classical su subject, the most important theorem used all the time is the implicit function theorem with the inverse function theorem as a special case. And error analysis uh, especially corresponds to the case then where you have a, an inverse function case where I'm just uh, in, my, in my, my situation here where I'm looking at the parameterized equation where I have f of x minus v equals zero. And the main situation I may be interested in is where v is equal zero, but in general, I would have solution set depending on v and, and, uh, and the error analysis would be concerned with that. So that's setting the stage, but now what I'm going to do in the first part of this lecture, almost the first half, is describe the, the more general situation that I want to try to deal with here, far more general than just equations. We want to welcome set valuedness because there are so many things that will benefit from this, uh, this extension. 
So we don't want just an equation. Now we run into a difficulty of language, and it's a difficulty in all the languages that I know, even ones that I don't know, like Chinese. It must be this problem. And we all know what equations are, but we have trouble finding a word that describes an extension. There's a word in French uh, which is called inequations. Maybe we could adopt that in English. Anyway, it's a set valued version of an equation. So I'm thinking of a set valued. Uh, mapping here from our n to our n. And I want to find a point that gives a zero of this equation. That is where zero is in the image of the mapping. When I write this, this the sign is the reverse of the belonging. So it's the same as zero being in this set. And uh, so this is the kind of problem I want to solve on an extremely large level. So another way of looking at that is that X belongs to the inverse of this mapping. The inverse, you remember, we can always define just by reversing the pairs in the graph of the mapping, and it's set valued again. So the solution to this set is the image of zero of the inverse mapping. And once again now, optimization is included in a, in a special case because we could be considering the case where the mapping M is a subgradient mapping. Then I'm looking for a point where zero is a subgradient. So that's obviously first order optimality. And then the idea of error analysis is this. So if, if I have an X, if I have an X, which I know that the set associated with M and X contains a vector of V, which is perhaps not zero. If it contains zero, I am a solution and I don't have to do anything more. But if it contains a V that isn't zero, the question is, can I use the size of that vector V to estimate the distance of X from the solution set? That's obviously something that would be useful in, error, in, in uh, analyzing a solution algorithm. Now, at this level of generality, uh, we simply can introduce a parameterization by saying that we have a set valid mapping uh, where the image depends not only on X, but on a parameter vector. And then for each choice of the parameter vector, I could get this, uh, well, I, I have the set of X's that would solve. This is a solution set as it depends on the parameter. And so then I have a certain set valid mapping, and then I have these same very general questions. It always is so wise to approach a, a, a topic at a very fundamental level because you learn so much. And if you succeed with the theory, then it will apply very, very far. So now, now the question is how, suppose there, uh, there is, we know there exists a solution X bar, or this is what I want to compute that corresponds to a particular P bar. But what if I change the P bar to some other P that's nearby? Then the question is, um, is there a solution nearby? Or in other words, is there a version of the implicit function theorem for this kind of solution mapping? Can I find some, well, there's a lot of different ways it could be. Could I find, for example, a, 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 a single value mapping that's, that represents this as a solution to the implicit function theorem? Well, the examples of this set valued uh, format are, are many, but some are very close at hand. So we could j just be looking at from a general level that we're uh, just, uh, we just have a lower semi-continuous proper function on our end. And we're looking at a point where the first order optimality condition is set, right, for a local minimum. And I'm just trying to find an X for that has that. Now associated with that, there is a solution mapping uh, which is, uh, in this case, because this is a mapping from Rn into itself, uh, we're looking for a given vector v, I look at the x's such that v is in this set, not just zero. So our, my desired solution set here would be s of zero in the given problem. But now I look at v as a parameter. And so that means that I'm looking at, from an optimization point of view, I'm looking at the points x such that I would have the first order condition for minimizing this function where a linear function is subtracted. This V is called a tilt perturbation in this function. And of course, if V is equal to zero, I have the, the original problem I'm interested in solving. So uh, this would be a question here. What about this solution mapping? What kind of things can we do with that? Now, uh, another version, a, a more general, uh, it gets into an area which is 
very important to my thinking because I think it's a mistake usually to just look at an optimization problem all by itself. You should almost always in, in some way introduce some sort of perturbation variables, uh, have some extra variables and then, uh, and then uh, see, and, and that way we'll have dual variables. So in this case, for example, if we think of a function f that's on a, a product space, uh, then I can, uh, and can look at uh, minimizing this function f subject to the second variable, the perturbation variable equals zero. And it seems that that doesn't accomplish anything, but it accomplishes a lot because it introduces dual variables. This is the, the origin of Lagrange multipliers on a fundamental level. So anyway, if I do that, then I would have a solution mapping where I could consider two kinds of perturbations. The, the, the U perturbation that's in the, in the definition of the function, but also the tilt perturbation. And for each choice of those two perturbation vectors, I could be looking at the primal dual pairs that satisfy this condition. So this is fundamentally in a theory of generalized Lagrangians and so forth. So this, that's certainly a set valued solution mapping in general. Now, here is a little more special uh, kind of a model for which you can get some stronger results. Um, this is, uh, again, we, what do we call it? An inequation? So what we've been calling it actually is a generalized equation. And uh, a generalized equation is not just the set valued mapping pure and simple, but it has some structure. Looking at the set F, F, M of X as the sum of a set N of X, and a function value. So I'm looking at a mapping f from R n to R n, and I'm looking at a closed graph set value mapping from R n to R n, and I take the sum of those, and that's my m of x. So this to say that zero is in m of x here, that's the same as saying that minus f of x bar would belong to the set n of x bar. That's the equivalent way to look at it. And then, you, then this actually can be parameterized. Now you can imagine you could parameterize it in both ways. I could ha have a parameter for F, I could have a parameter for N, they could both depend on the same or different parameters. But what's important for, for this model is that we can go very, very far by only parameterizing the F, where we have much more control because F was going to be smooth. This is a kind of model in which we have a special way to combine and utilize on the one hand smoothness, which is an F, and on the other hand, general variational analysis associated with some set value mapping, very uh, possibly a complicated one. So we have those two ways to go. So anyway, in the parametric version of a generalized equation, at least I think the most important kind of a version, instead of trying to, well, I'll give you an example of this in a minute, but uh, we don't have to necessarily uh, put parameters in the mapping. We, could, we can just work with that. Okay, so then I'm looking at a solution mapping in which I look at the x's such that for a given parameter vector, I will have this generalized equation solved. How is it a generalized equation? Well, we see right here, if, if the set valid mapping is the zero mapping, well, then I'm back to the classical equation. So it's different by adding a set valid mapping, which might be the zero mapping. And the particular case we've run into already is the one in which this mapping n is the normal cone mapping to some set. Because uh, this should be f, this shouldn't be g here, this is a typo. This should be f, f is this gradient mapping. Anyway, this is the first order optimality condition we've been looking at in optimization as an example over and over, but it's, it's not the only way to look at optimization. But this is a, a simple case where now we could put the parameters in the objective, but, but in this case, the set would be fixed. But you, but you say, in nonlinear programming, if this is nonlinear programming, then I might also want parameters in the constraint functions. But I'll show you how that works. We, we, we can actually cover that by, by looking at a broader view of what the set N should be and what the mapping F should be. So as a special case of a variational inequality, even more special, there's something called, of a, a, a generalized equation, there's something called a variational inequality model. And it has a, a, a geometric type and then a more general subgradient. So 
In general, it has exactly this form, like we saw in the optimality condition. I look at the normal cone. I have, I have a closed convex set, actually, a convex set. And I have the normal cone to that. And then I'm asking, and I have a mapping F, C1 mapping. I'm asking for minus F of X to belong to that normal cone. Now, that may seem very limited because I'm asking for the set C to be convex. And in a certain sense, it is. But I'll, I'll, I'll explain how we can, why it isn't as limiting as you might think. Now, why would this be called a variational inequality problem? This is a bit of an irritating situation. So th this, this term was invented by people working in France and Italy who were studying things in partial differential equations. And they were focusing on this from a different angle, which we now see has to do with a normal cone. Because if we, the definition of a vector being in this normal cone, of course, the, the X has to be in the set C, but it's, it's this, this inequality that defines a normal to the convex at C at this point. So this condition corresponds to a system of inequalities. So that means that this, this condition here corresponds to a system of inequalities that's supposed to be satisfied by F. Now, the part that's a little irritating for the English speakers is that this is a system of inequalities, not a single inequality. So it's like a variational inequalities problem. But anyway, I think it's much better that we should look at the normal cone mapping and not at these inequalities. And here's a picture of how it looks. It's very much like an optimality condition, except that instead of a gradient, we have some mapping F. And, uh, and so we have a set C and we have its normal cone, and we're asking for minus F to belong to this normal cone. And you notice that if the, if the set X bar is actually in the interior of the set, the normal cone is zero. Then I do get an equation. So this model is able to cover, on the one hand, the equation it can cover all the different possibilities of which constraints might or might not be tight, all in a single formula. And now there's a more general type, which we won't really be going into here, but you could replace the normal cone mapping by a subgradient mapping. This is also important in partial differential equations. And, this, and that was this subgradient mapping, of course, if we take the indicator subgradient or the indicator function, that's how we get the normal cone mapping. And here then is a variational inequality model uh, involving that convex set underlying set in which uh, I'm going to specialize the simple model, which seems to require a convex set, but in this sort of a nonlinear programming case. So we're going to look at the optimization problem. This, by the way, is something that's been known for a long time and was developed even by uh, Stephen Robinson, who developed the first uh, kind of implicit function theorem for generalized equations, which we're going to get to very soon. So we're looking now at, at uh, minimizing a, a smooth function F0 over a set defined by some constraints like this, where there's a set D. This vector should belong to some set D. But also, I'm asking for X to belong at the same time to some set X. And I'm going to assume, for my purposes here, that the set X is convex and the set D is convex and the set D is even a cone. So this could be the classical constraint cone. It could be the second order uh, cone. It could be the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. There's so many possibilities here, important ones for a cone. Then uh, we could apply the kind of uh, analysis I gave you earlier. I gave you for normal cones, I gave you a chain rule. I gave you a rule for the intersection of sets. Here, for example, we have an intersection of sets. And if I apply that, uh, using the fact that these are, are convex, I, I have under, uh, under a constraint qualification, to, I have that, the, that this condition can be expressed equivalently in terms of some kind of multiplier vector characterized by being in this normal cone to the set D at the point U bar, where for convenience, I wrote right U bar for this long vector of functions. U bar stands for that. And then, and then, and that this this, you, this multiplier vector which should should that minus f zero of x should belong to this normal cone to the set x plus this these terms with Lagrange multipliers and gradients. And there's furthermore the fact that I noticed uh, earlier this has to do with the fact that when you 
when you use uh, conjugate convex functions, you simply reverse the subgradient mappings. And this is a special case for clones. So this condition that Y should belong to this normal cone to D at this point can be written dually in dual form as this vector U bar here, the function vector should belong to the normal cone at the polar cone Y. So if I put that all together, then I can translate this condition that I have here, the original condition, this, this, this would be a variational inequality, but for the set C I have here, the set C would not be convex. So this would, would be a generalized equation that isn't necessarily a variational inequality. But the point is now that as, after I translate it for that, and if I introduce the function L, which is the, has the form of the classical Lagrangian equation, then I can rewrite all this, this characterization here. I can rewrite it in the following form. Minus the gradient of L in X should belong to the normal cone of X, whereas the gradient in Y should belong to the normal cone in Y. I just love this double formula. Look at the beautiful symmetry of that. It's also, if, if you ever studied things like um, calculus of variation, this is related, related to Hamiltonian conditions and something like, things like that that are well, well known in physics. So you could write it this way, but we're not done there because we can combine this this is a double condition. Each of these conditions looks like, like a separate uh, variational inequality condition because the sets X and Y are convex, but it's two different conditions with some overlap, but we can do it as follows. The normal cone to the product is itself the product of the normal cones. So I could introduce a function F of X, Y by having F of X be the gradient in L, but minus the gradient, and y, the gradient in x, and then minus the gradient. So this is not the gradient of L because it's, it's twisted. It has a minus in this position and not that. Anyway, that's that's a a, a nice uh, mapping. If, I, I should have said that the functions now should be maybe should be. I, I said C one here. Actually, I should probably say C two because I want these this uh, gradients to be uh, C one. Anyway, anyway, now I have. This, this is a variational inequality condition. And so now we can imagine that if we have these constraints and we want to interact, introduce a parameter P in the F0, but also a parameter vector that could, parameter vector that could affect all these constraints, then it simply means that I, I have here, instead of just F of XY in this set, I would have F of P, XY belongs to the same normal cone. So you see, I only needed to have the parameter in the smooth part. That's much easier to control. I don't need to have the parameter in this part and I can retain the convexity here. I don't have to go through a normal cone here where I have a set that depended on P, which is a much more complicated thing, but I could, and maybe it's valuable in some cases to do that. All right, now that's, that's so that's, uh, that's a, a changing point in this talk. I've been setting up the kind of problems for which we want to extend the theory. We have generalized equations with variational inequality models as a special case. And can we develop uh, inverse implicit function theorems, inverse mapping theorems for such a much more general object than the classical equations? The answer will be yes, but to understand and appreciate the answer, we really need to look at it. I should remind you of the classical context, the classical implicit function theorem. So in a, cl a classical implicit th function theorem, I'm looking at a mapping from Rn to Rn that depends on another parameter, P. And I'm interested in, basically, I'm interested in solving for X in terms of P. That's the way we always say it. I want to solve this equation for X in terms of P. And I, and I have to work around a particular solution. This is always the context. I know a particular solution, and I want to solve this in some local sense around that. So for all P near, here's what I want to know. I want to determine if it's true or not, and if so, and so forth. Uh, that for all p that near to this p bar, there will be a unique x within a certain neighborhood of x bar, such that I get the solution. So then I will get x as a solution depending on p. So I, and I could have a solution mapping then s of p, s of p, and then that would mean that I would have this 
this equation satisfied. So this is, would be the implicit function that's in there. Uh, but now a special case of this, for which I'll introduce a G instead, is where I'm looking at a mapping G just from Rn to Rn. And uh, <clears throat> I have a particular image for, for X bar, I have the image is, is V bar. And then I want to know whether I can invert this function locally. So I want to know if for all V near V bar, there is a unique X in the neighborhood of X bar that solves this so that I would get an inverse function, which I'm calling T here, inverse function T such that G applied to that. So I'm getting a local inverse of G. Of course, we could imagine something set value, but at the moment I'm focusing on single value, a, a function S, a function T, so forth. And you'll notice, of course, that the inverse problem and the inverse uh, mapping thing would be a special case of the implicit one because I could choose the, this parameterization. I'm looking at V as a parameter. I look at this mapping, this difference equals zero. That would be an example of this F. And then I, I solve that with V. So, so uh, but, but let's remind, so, okay. So why do I even bother with the inverse? We'll just work with the equation problem and then we'll solve it. After we have an answer for the equation problem, we'll apply it to the inverse problem. But interestingly, that's not the way to do it. It turns out that the inverse, they go together. And, and you see this now in the following statement of the implicit function theorem. This is different from the way it's written in calculus text, but I'm writing it this way because this is exactly how to see how to go forward with this. So, I want this. So here's what I want. I want this implicit function S. And it says that I will have a yes answer to that problem about that implicit function. If, if when I look at an, an inverse problem, a special inverse problem, I look at the inverse problem in which I apply the linearization of my function F. I fix the parameter, but I just linearize it in the X argument at this X bar. And I look at that, if that inverse problem has a yes answer, then the original equation has a yes answer. Well, how does that relate? That doesn't sound like the classical implicit function theorem probably for you because you're saying, well, we know what the criterion in the equation case for the implicit function theorem is. You should look at this, uh, Jacobian uh, uh, vector in X, and you should ask that it has full rank. But full rank is exactly the condition that means that this linearized uh, problem, inverse problem, has a solution. Exactly the criterion here for that. But when we go beyond the classical situation, we don't just have a Jacobian. So that's why it's important to look at it this way. All right, so now I want to look at uh, what we mean in a little more detail about a localization of a solution mapping. This is needed even in the classical inverse function, in implicit function theorem and so forth, but it's not made as explicit as we now need to make it because we now embrace the fact that we have a solution mapping. Even in the case of an equation, classical equation, you have the inverse uh, mapping is set valued in general. So we, anyway, we have... In general, we have a solution mapping. And here I just imagine I have a mapping from a parameter space to Rn and has closed graph. And then I look at a particular pair, P bar, X bar, that's in the graph. And then and here's a picture of it. So here's my weird, this is set value mapping. Uh, if, I, if I looked at a point here, I could get all kinds of different values here, so integral values. But what I'm looking at at this point is if I look at a small enough neighborhood, like this, will I find that this, the intersection, that this will be a single value mapping in that neighborhood. Now classically, so that's just what a single value localization is, but classically the focus is on more. You want the single value localization to be differentiable. And you want to know what the gradient is. Actually, you want the gradients, all of you want the whole gradients of the whole mapping as, as formula for its derivative. 
But, but that doesn't work for us in, in, in optimization because we don't usually get differentiability. For example, in a nonlinear programming problem, you can't expect that the solution, a local solution will behave in a smooth way when you move constraints around. Because when you move constraints around, they can be, become inactive or a new constraint could be active. And when things become active or inactive, there's some kind of jump in derivatives. So, so you can't expect differentiability, but what we can look for is Lipschitz continuity. So we're looking at whether we can have a single value uh, uh, localization that would be Lipschitz continuous. And if so, we want an estimate of something about it, which is the Lipschitz modulus of that at the point P bar. And that's defined as the smallest Lipschitz constant as you shrink the neighborhood smaller and smaller what kind of constant can you get in a limit as the Lipschitz modulus for that? All right, now here we go to a, a huge landmark uh, result, which has now been, been further. So uh, we're talking about a result which was pioneered by Robinson back in the early 1980s. It's since been generalized as one of the things that uh, uh, Dunchev and I worked on in our uh, our much more recently, for example, all possible generalizations you can do of this. Uh, but, <clears throat> but now you'll see why I, I put the classical implicit function theorem, why I stated it the way I did. So now we have a generalized equation framework. I have a mapping F that's a C1 mapping. And I have, uh, uh, I'm looking at a generalized equation. And it has a parameter that's incorporated into this capital F. We know this is going to apply in particular to nonlinear programming problems, which is what Robinson did. But this is much more general. I just and I don't and what's important is I'm I'm taking any any I'm not making any restriction on this n except that it's a mapping with closed graph. No restriction. Of course, special cases will give us special results, but I don't need it for the theorem. And this goes beyond what Robinson had. He had something more generalized. He had a normal cone mapping to con convex cone or something. Okay, anyway, this is the solution mapping for a parameterized generalized equation. And I'm looking at a particular parameter vector, P bar, and a particular solution there. And then I'm looking to see whether, whether the solution mapping has a single valued localization, little s, which of course would give me X bar at P bar. So this is, this is a set value version, how we can deal with this, except at this point, we're asking for to, we're trying to make a single valued version out of this, out of the solution mapping in general. There's some more generalizations beyond this that don't require it, but this is so important. When can it be single valued? All right, now, as, as you saw, we cannot just ignore the inverse function framework. What I'm going to do is, look at the linearization of the smooth mapping in X at this fixed reference parameter value. So this is a linear, a linear mapping in X. And I'm going, and then, and then the solution mapping for this is the, is the, is that I'm gonna look for where, uh, well, okay, this is just because I still have a generalized I have minus G would be N of X, but now I have a parameterization by this uh, tilt type vector B. So I'm looking at this solution mapping T of V equals the axis such that if I this per with perturbation of V, it's, a, it's a, the parameterization for a inverse mapping theorem. And, and this by, by its nature as it's a linearization, we'll have that at the zero uh, vector V, I will have X bar will be in it. So. And then I could look here for a possible single value localization of that, this localization T, which would give me X bar at zero. So I look at these two problems and, and uh, now that we have the right framework, we have this stunningly re clear reflection of the classical theorem. It says that the general mapping has a Lipschitz continuous single value localization F when the much more special inverse version has Lipschitz continuous single value localization T. And if that's the case, then we get an estimate for the Lipschitz constant modulus for S in terms of Lipschitz constant for this 
more special mapping and and uh, this thing here. So so this is uh, uh, this is uh, so dramatically uh, similar. It's just really you know so exciting to see how how you can find something so close to the classical thing. Now, does this include the classical theorem? Not exactly, because the classical theorem will go on to say things about the differentiability, just not not just Lipschitz continuity. So it's it's more uh, uh, an augmentation of the classical theory. And of course, what's left, what's the hypothesis is of this theorem is that this thing has single value localization. So if you look at the nonlinear programming version, then it was necessary to go further and show, for example, that in nonlinear programming, uh, certain kinds of second order optimality conditions would guarantee that this linearized version would have condition. And so, and so, so it could go. So in all these special applications, you'd have to look at how to verify that this line here, this assumption as, as true. Okay, now we can go on to uh, other generalizations where there are Lipschitz-like properties of, of, of the set value mapping. So I need to remind you of some notation here. I'm going to use this fancy B as meaning the closed unit ball in Rn. And then I want to remind you that in the set notation, if I add, and so then epsilon B would be the, not the unit ball, but the ball unit, but the ball around the origin with radius epsilon. And then if I add to a set C this epsilon B, what I'm getting is the set of all points X that are at a distance less than or equal epsilon. So this means I'm adding an epsilon layer of fat to the set C, because this is going to come in in a moment. So what we're, what we're going to describe is, you know, what could it mean for a set value mapping to be Lipschitz continuous? There's some, you could make some conjectures, but they might not be the most useful thing. This is now understood to be by far the most useful idea to, to use. So it, and it's the following. So I have a set value mapping. So I'm going to compare the set at a point P and the set associated with a point P prime. And I'm looking here at the set for P prime, I'm then adding, this is some kind of epsilon here. I'm adding some kind of epsilon fat, an epsilon layer of fat, but the epsilon depends on the distance between P and P prime. But there's some lambda that's uniform, that's uniform for all the P and P prime in this set. Epsilon, some adequate layer of fat, but as P and P prime, get closer to each other, it would be a shorter layer. And then I don't require that the whole set S of P lies in it, but just the set, a localized version. So this is a localized version around a given U bar. So this localized version should belong to this thing with this layer of fat. I don't have to look at the difference between two sets however that would be interpreted. And this U is, is uniform here for the neighborhood is uniform. Okay, so this is the O'Bannon property, which is Lipschitz-like. It's the right generalization of local Lipschitz continuity for a sat valid mapping. And then there's, there could be a modulus for that. And then there's another thing which is called calmness, which is pretty much the same thing, except that in this case, the there's no P prime. I keep the parameter fixed at, uh, P and, and, and P prime is fixed at P bar, and I'm just looking at the same kind of condition here. Okay, and then, then the kind of theorem I told you, that thing, if it works for T, then it works for S, all it holds in the same pattern. If, if the T thing has this and so forth. So I'll just skip over that, but it's, it's, it's amazing. All right, now I can start talking about error analysis. Getting back a little more, I talked about this at the beginning. Uh, how are we going to estimate things in the errors that, that we will encounter in algorithms? So we're going to look at this now in terms of just a general mapping having closed graph from a space Rn into a space Rm. And uh, I'm interested in just solving this inequation, solving, finding a point where zero is in the set L of x. And then that means I'm the solution set to my problem is the inverse mapping at zero. This is some closed set, possibly empty. I, I suppose I will have some apply some condition where it's not empty. 
And uh, then I imagine that, that in solving it, I will be doing some computations. But in those computations, I, I won't yet know this X bar. I'm trying to find it, but I didn't find it yet. What I did find was I encountered something I believe is close to this X bar. And, uh, but it's not exactly. And then I have to look at the following idea. So how, what does that mean that I'm close to being a solution? Here's, here's the way to look at it. I have the solution error could be the distance of X from the solution set. How far X is from the solution set? Not just from some particular X bar. I don't know X bar yet. I want to find X bar, but I'll, how close is X to some element of the solution set. So that's the knowledge that is desired. But I don't have that, I only have X. But what I probably do have is I know what the set M of X is uh, for that X. And so I could ask how close is zero to M of X? And this would be, this is the residual. If this distance gives me the residual, the residual error. Uh, so that's accessible. So I want to relate the successful knowledge to the desired knowledge. And that's exactly what is done in the concept of metric regularity. And it is local. So it does revolve around some particular solution. So uh, there, there are neighborhoods in this case of X bar and zero, such that the following holds. Remember, I'm trying to relate these two quantities and that's what I'm going to do. So, so the distance of X from M of, from the inverse at V is less than or equal to this constant times the distance of V from M of X. Now in my build up here, I'm speaking about X equals zero. And there is a more special case now, which is called metric subregularity, in which I don't bother with other vectors V, but I just bother, I just fix it in zero. This looks like it's a little more directly applicable, but, 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 but that would be a mistake because this is, this is a more stable type of condition, which might be even more useful. But the point is, how is this related to anything I've been talking about? Why did I introduce those concepts here? Like Urban property, the calmness property. Okay, they were involved in some generalization of the implicit function theorem, but, there, but there's more to them because they, they have a very important role just right here. Here's the connection. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this M having closed graph, and I'm interested in trying to find V such X such that in general, I have V is a perturbation here. I'm looking at for each V, what X is uh, have V and M of X. So that's the solution mapping is the inverse mapping here, M minus one. And uh, I want to think of this as a solution mapping. And then I want to think of what possible Lipschitz-like properties this has. So I could be looking at whether I get a single value of Lipschitz continuous localization. That would be covered actually by the theorems I, I gave. <clears throat> but, but, but here's what I want to tell you about how it's related to, to metric regularity. These are results that were played with by many people. For example, Jonathan Borline was had a role in all of this. And, and then don't you and I extended a lot as well. So a P, M is metrically regular, regular at this particular solution in the solution set, if and only if the inverse has the Oban property. So at that point, and in that case, the, the, the metric regularity constant is the reciprocal of the Lipschitz constant of the inverse mapping. How oh, wonderful. So metric regularity is the inverse property to this kind of basic Lipschitz continuity property of a set value map. But this is all set value map, set value. And then there's something similarly for metric subregularity, except then it has this calmness property. And then you could use, a, then we could look at special cases like where we have variational inequalities or generalized equations and apply the implicit function theorem in special cases to, to understand all that metric regularity further. <clears throat> I want to look though at a, at a more special case which doesn't necessarily fit quite, oh, it, it does. Okay, I want to look at what's called tilt stability. It's come in before. So uh, how does all this fit in a case of tilt stability? Because there's something very special and, and fruitful about 
every time you look at tilt stability. So the, the, the picture here is that we're looking at a proper uh, function on Rn, and we're just trying to look at points where we have a local minimum. So the, the candidates for that are the points where zero is a subgradient. And then I bet, but you know, but approximate candidates are ones where instead of zero being in there, there is some V which is in that set and V is near to zero. So this actually fits the framework I was just talking about. I'm talking about M, M is the, is the, is this uh, subgradient mapping. I'm applying this to M being the subgradient mapping. So the solution mapping here is, is the inverse of the subgradient mapping. And I'm looking at it on a particular point and I'm, I'm going to ask, well, when is, this, when is this going to be metrically regular? So that would tell me how, how does this, or maybe I should remind you that, well, it's coming up anyway. When I, I look at this V, I, I, this is a tilt perturbation. So, so I'm, I'm interested in how this local minimum uh, behaves under a tilt. So, uh, by, but I'm going to look at the metric regularity of that, and and uh, a, a deep motivation is that uh, behind that is connections with sufficiency and local minimization. So we have here's a, a definition now: tilt stability. I will say that this in this situation I have tilt stability. Suppose x bar is a local minimizer; it minimizes locally, and it's 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 a strong a tilt stability in the following sense: there's a neighborhood of this x bar and a neighborhood of a tilt, a tilt neighborhood, tilts near zero, such that if I look at this mapping that assigns to a tilt ve vector, the argmin over the set U, are the local taking a local minimum, take a local minimum with this parameter. This is the tilting term then this, this localized mapping would be single valid in Lipschitz continuous. So actually what I'm doing is looking for a single valid Lipschitz continuous localization of this inverse of the subgradient mapping. And here's the result. That holds if and only if the, sub, the, the mapping is metric regularity, regular there. And in that case, the mapping is strongly monotone. I didn't define strongly monotone, but that will be seen in a moment. Let's go on now to local monotonicity of subgradient mappings. Um, what does it mean to say that a subgradient mapping is strongly locally mon? And how is that? That's the property that's tied to this tilt stability. And remember, my motivation, what I'm trying to show you is a connection with all of this and, and uh, sufficient conditions for optimization. I'm sure you haven't forgotten my stress that uh, when you want to look at a sufficient condition, you want to know how helpful it is. And one of the ways it could be helpful is that it get, tells you something about, about um, stability and approximations of your solution. So now, okay, so what does local monotonicity mean? So I'm looking at my subgradient mapping. Here's the graph of it. And I'm looking at a point X bar where zero is a subgradient. So this pair is in the graph. So then I will take a neighborhood of that pair because this is local. And, uh, and the question is, will there exist such a neighborhood such that in that neighborhood, when I look at the various pairs that are in the graph that are in that neighborhood, this monotonicity inequality will be satisfied. This will just be local monotonicity of the subgradient mapping. And strong local monotonicity is the case where instead of just having zero on the right-hand side, I have a quadratic term with some positive quadratic constant here taken to be sigma. Now, if you're looking very closely at this, you'll see I put a little red star up here on this neighborhood. The reason it did is I'm not being completely accurate in stating this definition because I don't have space to deal with it completely. The, 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 the small issue, and when you look at the papers or books, you'll, it's all laid out very clearly. Here you see I'm localizing in the graph, but one of the, what I really also have to do is localize 
in the function values. You remember in the very definition of subgradients, I also have to worry about limits of function values or I might get the wrong concept. And so, so and I, I have to have a neighborhood and a function value too. But anyway, so then what you get is, uh, uh, well, okay, now let's remember what, what global monotonicity did. In the case of a, a global monotonicity of subgradient mapping, Global monotonicity is the local monotonicity where local is global. In other words, if this neighborhood is the whole space, then I have monotonicity in the earlier global form. And in that case, we know, uh, it was known from, for a lot of people that convexity implied monotonicity, but uh, Pollock N proved that the inverse was true too, if your monotonicity implied convexity. And, and this can be generalized. Also, strong monotonicity is equivalent to strong global uh, convexity, global convexity of, of F. But what about the local? Is it true then that local monotonicity corresponds to a locally convex function or local strong monotonicity? That's after all the concept here in this function. That's local strong one. Is it that enclosed to local strong convexity of the function? No, no, you, you might think so. It's not. Local. Local convexity does give local monotonicity, but not conversely. And the reason is that when you talk about local convexity, you are localizing in the X argument only. So that's accomplished by this neighborhood U. You're localizing in the X argument here. But local monotonicity also has localization in the dual argument. That's not reflected when you say that a function is locally convex. This is something more. So this is, a, this is a, something we're getting into my more recent research over the last several years. I got quite interested for several reasons in trying to understand this. And, uh, and I came up with a characterization of it. Actually, I already knew something about it in the strong case, which we're involved with right here, but I wanted it more generally. And, and there wasn't any name for it earlier thing that I worked on. So I decided it could be called variational convexity. And this is a property of a function f, which is equivalent to this local monotonicity. And the strong version is equivalent to strong local monotonicity. So, so to go back a moment again here, the functions for which, which are the functions for which you will have this tilt stability, which, which when you have a local minimum here, Minimize the nearest function, and, and you have a minimizer. What property of this minimizer corresponds to this tilt stability, which is some basic property that could have a valuable role in numerical methods? And the property, as I say, is, is this. This, this sub subgradient mapping is going to be strongly monotone locally, but it doesn't mean that the function is convex. This result can be applied in all kinds of other things for essential objectives of nonlinear programming problems, but it's getting beyond the scope of this talk because everything's limited here. So, uh, so there's this, this concept, and I hope you will look into it. So um, now I'm approaching the end, and I want to say that this is, a, in other talks, this was the last slide, but I have one more after this. So um, I just want to give you some like study guide. So, so although the, the variational analysis book has in chapter nine uh, 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 quite a bit about uh, uh, single Lipschitzian properties of metric regularity and things like that, uh, uh, most of what I've been talking about this lecture is much better studied in the book, more recent book uh, with the Sam uh, We wrote that back in 2009 uh, well, that pub came out in 2009, but then there was already a second edition that came out in 2014. Unfortunately, I never got a chance to write a second edition of the uh, convex analysis book, and I couldn't do it either with a variational analysis book because there was some kind of standard that you had to had to modify at least 20% of the book or something. But but the first a version of the variational analysis book did have some things like some mistakes that had to be corrected. So there were three printings of that book and you should look at the third printing because it has its corrections. But anyway, it wasn't another edition. 
But now, if you want more on this tilt stability, this is where I got this. My recent research, I hope you look at this. So to do that, what you should do is look at my articles here uh, on my website. And here's the website. Go to this website, and you could download these two articles. And this is the one that introduces this variational convexity on a general level and proves the main result about it. And this is the one, again, which is about augmented Lagrangian methods, which very much uses it. But, and then there's this thing what I'm calling the variational sufficient condition for a local minimum. So there's quite a, quite a lot there about uh, that. And it all plays into numerical methodology. And later, in a later paper, that's what, number 258, uh, I'm, I'm developing convergence results for augmented Lagrangian methods that are, that are um, articulated in a very general context, not just nonlinear programming. And here's the final slide. I want you to alert you to something that might be useful to you, especially uh, beginners in the subject who want to learn a kind of optimization that's tilted towards variational analysis. So my two of my longtime collaborators, my very longtime collaborator, Roger Wetz, and then there's Johannes Royset in California, they have a book which is and it's an introductory book to, for optimization, which might be used as a textbook. I don't know if it's good enough on, well, on the undergraduate level, but certainly on the graduate level. And the special thing about this book is that it, it puts a lot of emphasis on two things that, that are newer and should be there, the variational analysis and also stochastic optimization. So right from the early stage, it, it treats the special things that are in stochastic optimization. And by the way, this, this morning I had a conversation with Roger Wetz in which he told me that uh, his whole interest in developing things like epiconvergence was because of the, uh, the needs he had to apply such things in stochastic programming, in a conversion, stochastic kinds of convergence. And this book is not yet out, but it, it was supposed to be available this month, but. Roger tells me now that they expect it to be out in January next month, in other words. All right, that's the end of my talk for today. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful talk. So do we have any questions from the particip participant? Now, actually, I have one question from Professor Zhang Guochuan, who is actually the main organizer of this forum. Unfortunately, he cannot make it right now because he is in the middle of his teaching. I type the the question in the in the chat box. Can you read it, Professor? Okay. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm the right person to do this because I'm the one uh, who uh, developed a theory, but I'm not working necessarily on the front line of this. My, my front line research myself is in this augmented Lagrangian theory. There's certainly a lot to do. And uh, um, I, 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 I've mentioned areas of application I think would be very valuable, like putting, like, like uh, looking more into how to, how to apply variational analysis to kind of optimization that occurs in basic statistics even. And, and then getting the, getting the statistics of set valued mappings that are going to depend on random problems and things like that. What is the solution set to a, a random problem? How could you, how could you uh, uh, get uh, laws of large numbers and so forth for that? And there, is, there are results to be used from the work of Roger Wetz for that. Um, I, I do uh, see a lot more further to go on second order optimization. Uh, what are uh, optimality conditions for this? Relating the parabolic derivatives to the epiderivative, second order epiderivatives. And, and as discussed yesterday, uh, a prime example would be to work out all the details of this for the uh, second order, for, for the uh, uh, positive semi definite cone of matrices. What are all these different kinds of uh, curvature results going to turn out to be? What are all these optimality conditions? And then, then the, the results I've been working on in, in, uh, for augmented Lagrangians in, in the papers that you will see there, it's only for a certain kind of a 
it's a very general problem, but still it must be possible to go much further than that. I, I didn't, for example, work out those results for problems involving uh, uh, positive semi-definite, uh, positive semi-definite cones. So for positive semi-definite programming, I did not work out the augmented Lagrangian methods, and I, I won't. But there must be a lot of uh, material that could be uh, could be done in, in in those directions. Okay. Speaking of augmented Lagrangian, yeah, I'm there's too old. <laughs> a technical question from myself. Okay, so to to derive the convergence of augmented Lagrangian method, you always Need some kind of constraint qualification. My question is, how weak do you think the constraint qualification can be for convergence? Well, I see it not so much, okay, constraint qualification. You need, <clears throat> as far as I understand it, the, the well, what, what you should really look at at some point is, is this paper of mine number 256. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then the follow-up in 258, which is, it's so, so uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, the constraint qualification is mostly to get a necessary condition. So what I'm looking at, you know, it's actually, this is a very good question to discuss. So what, what, how should we exactly look at this question? So uh, I think we're looking at it from some different points of view. From my point of view, I'm going to describe first the kinds of points for which I could be successful in applying the augmented Lagrangian method. And in describing them, I'm going to use a sufficient condition, not necessarily the weakest possible sufficient condition, but a sufficient condition that, that includes some kind of like stability or growth conditions that promote the convergence of the augmented Lagrangian method. And for those, you don't need a, a constraint qualification. Constraint qualification comes in on the necessary level, the necessary condition. And, 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 and then the necessary condition, or you could say, I'm looking at second order necessary conditions and weaker and weaker second order necessary conditions. But it's very good to be talking about this again because this is, I, th I think, is so important to try to try to get across the point of view that uh, having a weaker and weaker kind of condition is not necessarily better if it, it if it if it's going to be worse for your conversion, so I could I could phrase your question a little bit differently. So so I, I could say so in my paper, I'm going to give a sufficient condition under which it's possible to convert to show the convergence of the augmented Lagrangian method. And you could ask, is there a weaker condition under which the augmented Lagrangian method could converge? But it probably would converge with weaker characteristics. So it'd be a complementary type of a, there's more than one way. Okay, there's just pure convergence, but there's all the error analysis. What can you do with error analysis? How stable is it under perturbations? So it's another way to look at it. So, so it's another very general point of view. You're going to solve an optimization problem. And, uh, and so you will have some, some algorithm that proposes to solve that. Thing. But the uh, optimization problem will have errors. But you have to remember too that the very statement of the, of the problem has errors. The very representation of the problem with functions. The functions are only being approximated. Somehow there are, there are errors in the, in, the, in the formulation of the problem. So it seems to me that you, you would like to have a method which is stable even if the problem has, if, if slight errors in the problem will still give you something near to the regular solution. So, a, 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 a characterization of, of, of sufficient condition for optimality that allows for some more stability in the statement of the problem gives you a stronger kind of a, a solution method. You know, it's, it's good to work on all these different things, but these are complementary. It's not, it's not, I just want to emphasize, just having an algorithm that can converge under weaker conditions it's not necessarily better because it may not converge as stably. I see. An answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other question from the participant? Now, I I do have another question from Professor uh, Han Daren. He was just right here, but now he's in the middle of some other meetings. I type it. Uh, <laughs> in the chat box. Now, can you read it? 
All right. Well, I'm not quite sure I interpret this question. What, what I what I love about optimization theory, we all know that optimization is very, very uh, important, practical uh, subject. And um, uh, the question sounds like I should be uh, helping to describe a little more why it's important. I just don't know how I could really do that. Uh, uh, optimization is being used everywhere. Nowadays, for example, it's obvious that data science is driving a lot of uh, things in optimization, but there are also things like optimal design and engineering. You have to design some kind of uh, uh, mechanical or uh, physical object that has just parameters, and you have to optimize that. And, uh, and how would you do it? So these are very practical things, and uh, they involve uncertainty. And uh, how, how to deal with uncertainty and how to deal with risk. This is a subject I've, I've also spent quite a lot of effort in over the last 20 years. The theory of risk in optimization. What is risk? How do you take it into account? How do you use it in an optimization problem? So this, this would be a, a good example of, of a theory which is kind of being used, but it's still, so many people don't really know how to deal with it. But there is a systematic theory of risk and how to look at an optimization. And by the way, that you will see that in this book that's on the screen right now, this, this book by Royset and Wetz, uh, it does introduce not only uh, uh, uncertainty in optimization and emphasize importance, but also it, it does bring in the theory of risk. And then the theory of risk even brings in this, on the statistical side, this estimation. So, 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 so uh, in, in risk, for example, you are not worried so much about the average things that happen, but you're worried about the extreme things that might happen. And, and a lot of classical uh, uh, statistics looks more towards the center, where you look at the mean, you look at the variance, and uh, you worry about that. But And so you estimate, you estimate something in terms of mean and variance, but that doesn't necessarily estimate very well what extremes could happen. And when, you, and when you're gonna optimize, you wouldn't wanna just optimize on, well, I guess I'm making it clear. So, so you need more of the theory of risk. So I think you would find, uh, perhaps this would help the answer. Look at this book, please, when it comes out. I think it would, would really help a lot. Okay, thank you. Any, any other question? Yeah. Professor, yeah, do you have any question? Yeah, Terry, uh, so, uh, so uh, from the, what you were saying about the, the modern outlook, we should, we should uh, maybe, um, because uh, um, variation of convexity, uh, variation of sufficient condition for optimality, maybe weaker than the function being locally convex. Uh, so we should we should try to try to maybe get some uh, sufficient condition for this to hold, right? Then we we get the optimality, then we get local minimum of the solution. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you should, the uh, uh, best thing for you is to look at this paper number mm -hmm. 256 that I'm talking about. I'll go back to this screen here. Mm -hmm. and that, because I think you will understand quite quickly uh, down here, I talk about, okay, talk about 256, this one. Because um, you will understand quickly that uh, how this fits in. So I'm, I'm not just talking about an abstract function f to begin with. Mm -hmm. Looking at a model in which I generalize nonlinear programming not only in terms of the constraints and that kind of generalization, but I also include the dual, the perturbation that gives you Lagrange multipliers. So there's a, a primal dual framework for this in which you get a Lagrangian. You also get a Lagr augmented Lagrangian, very generally. Mm -hmm. Whole concept of augmented Lagrangian, but in this paper, 
as in what I was talking about today, there's a, on the one hand, there is the smooth part represented by some smooth functions. On the other hand, there are some things like subgradient mappings. And anyway, what you do is you get an augmented Lagrangian function. And there is a, 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 a second order optimality condition that's involved. So uh, on the one hand, there's a second order optimality condition involved, which I developed already in an even earlier paper than these, 250 or something like that, for, in some decomposition work. And that second order optimality condition involved the, the variational convexity of the essential objective function in this primal dual setting. And that's, that's a function which is extended valued and it's a function of both and the parameter vector u and there's some kind of, and that's, and I, you know, anyway, there's some variational convexity invoked for that function, which is not convex. Mm -hmm. It's effective domain isn't convex necessarily, but in the paper I'm, I'm trying to emphasize here, is 256, uh, it, it's shown, I, I just love this result. It's shown that this, this sufficient condition is equivalent to has that, that the augmented Lagrangian at this primal dual pair, not just has a saddle point, but it's just locally convex and concave. The augmented Lagrangian is locally convex concave. Well, so it sort of means that this is this sufficient, this particular kind of sufficient condition coming from uh, variational convexity identifies a situation in which from a local point of view, you're really dealing with convex optimization. This to me was a huge shock and insight to realize, even, even going back to the, the basic optimality conditions in nonlinear programming. The second order optimality conditions that people use, what it actually does is identify a case where your, 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 your problem is really a problem in the, con as long as you're only working near, near a solution, you're really in, the, in convex analysis. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you would already know this class. Suppose you just minimize a twice differentiable function on Rn, uh, unconstrained minimization, optimality condition for those say, okay, the Hessian matrix should be positive definite. Well, that, that means that the function is convex around that point. So certainly the classical unconstrained minimization is that you are minimizing locally or you're minimizing a convex function. But even then in the, in the nonlinear programming, take the case of nonlinear programming with equation constraints, um, uh, you know, we, we look at the second order optimality conditions. You look at, you know, you look at the, the, the there's a subspace over which the Lagrangian uh, should have a, a Hessian that's positive. That's this classical second order condition. This exactly says that the augmented Lagrangian will be convex concave. So again, even there. And then, then this, what this paper does is do this further and further. And actually, this is only part of it. I still have more to do on this subject. I, I can do this more generally, and I'm going to be working on that. But so, so this, for, for me, the, the, the special insight, which I'm so enthusiastic about, it's not the only way to look at things, but it, it's, a, it's something fundamental that has particular meaning. It has, there is a class of sufficient condition, which is able to identify exactly when the problem reduces to, to a convex problem in a local sense. And, and then that also then is connected to this kind of stability, stability properties that enhance the algorithm. So if you don't have this, then you are definitely missing some kind of stability property and your algorithm will, you know, you maybe can still show it will com compute. But I really want to guard against the idea that a sharper and sharper, uh, su sufficient, a weaker and weaker sufficient condition or an algorithm that can somehow manage to work is necessarily better. And this is just complementary. It's complementary because it may be more delicate. If, it, if it's not able to, to, to uh, react to perturbations 
problems that are commonly encountered, then it's somehow delicate. You're delicate. So I, I just, I, I think the beginning, at least the introduction to this paper, this truth, the introduction of that should be, should be pretty accessible. First and second sections may be accessible. You don't have to worry about the rest. And that would tell you an awful lot about what it is I'm doing and why it's doing and why I think it has a future. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. does it also applicable to other algorithms than augmented Lagrangian? What do you think? Yes. So, so, so after after I show this, then then I'm I'm, I'm using it that way, but but it shows a basic kind of stability of, of the whole of these the whole situation. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and well, <clears throat> augmented Lagrangians aren't just augmented Lagrangian methods. They are a way of capturing second order optimality. So, any, any kind of any, let me say this. Any kind of algorithm that is essentially going to be a second order type of algorithm and, or an optimization, from my perspective, is it should be involved with the augmented Lagrangian one way or another, because it's a tool of expressing uh, stability and second order optimality. You know, you, you mentioned to me that. Uh, yeah. We were talking that you were interested in generalizing second order conditions. Mm -hmm. and I thought a little bit about the kind of generalization that you were you told me about, and I think a lot could be done with that and and mm -hmm. interesting results in that direction. But everything would be complementary because again, what that, that would be would to get kind of a, a, a second order uh, optimality under you know it's a it's a condition that's satisfied more often maybe. But that's just complementary because it's satisfied more often. But on the other hand, it just, just describes a situation that, for a numerical point of view, may not be as stable. Maybe you all remember in the history of nonlinear programming, for many years at the beginning of the history, people were always working on constraint qualifications. There's so many points. Mm -hmm. Abadi's constraint qualification, Guignard's constraint qualification, everybody wanted to work on a different constraint qualification. Okay, now we look back at that in history. What good was all of that? How, how important was all, were all those constraint qualifications? They weren't really important. Why? Because they just describe situations that are more and more delicate, and, you, and there's no way you can ever verify it anyway. This is why I, why I emphasize that the importance of these optimality conditions, even, even constraint qualifications, is what you understand by them. The understanding that they provide that could influence a numerical method. Now, so I didn't have a chance uh, in these lectures because the time is so limited, but let me just go back here for a moment to something I, I uh, earlier here. Okay, so uh, in, in this slide, in this second half of this slide, you see um, something of my primal dual formulation. I don't just look, I, I, I think this is such wise advice if, that everybody should really take to heart. Don't just look at, this, uh, at, at a, a problem isolated by itself. That's what this problem is. I have a function and I'm trying to look at look at it in terms of perturbation of do a perturbation parameter. So so I look at this not just f of x but f of x u. Well I have it down here. Hope you can read it in brown. F of x u. Not just f of x but introduce there's so many different ways. You could introduce this in so many ways. So by the way, I have to tell you something that's, uh, well, oh, no, no, let me just not get into that. Okay, so you have the x u. And, and then you, when, once you've introduced those, that's the key to getting dual variables. So, so over here, you just have this as your first order optimality condition. Okay, here you have this as your second order optimality condition where you see the dual 
variable appearing as the cell gradient aspect with respect to the, this, this uh, U. All right, but what, what do you need to assume in order to show that this exists? So here we don't need any constraint qualification. How can I show that? So I want to look at, this is a problem where I'm minimizing this function of x u subject to u equals zero. It seems trivial. Why, why should you minimize this subject to x u equals zero? Why not just put zero there? And I'm trying to, trying to explain this. It's very important to do that because this is what introduces dual variables. I don't have to tell you how important dual variables are in optimization. This is a framework that includes, for example, the Karushkund-Tucker theorem uh, conditions. All right, so there's a constraint qualification. So I'm getting around to the point. What does that constraint, I wish I could have a slide to explain this to you. There's a constraint qualification that shows the existence. And what does that say? It actually says, it's equivalent to saying that if I, if, if I look at the mapping that goes from U to the epigraph of the function where I'm minimizing the F. So for each U, I have a function of X and that function has an epigraph. And that mapping from U to that epigraph has the Obana property. This is the Lipschitz-like property. It has the Obana property. So here I have to, to get this, which I regard as fundamental. It's, this, it's a stability property. It says that if I look at, you remember for each U I have an optimization problem in X. I wish this weren't just in this brown color and I hope you can read it. For each U I have an optimization problem in X. And, and that is described by a single function of X and that's that function. And as I change U, I'm moving that function. So how, how, what stability do I have in that? Well, it's saying that this problem is in a local sense. This is a local version of epiconvergence of a Lipschitz kind. And so the, so the very constraint qualification is connected with stability. As soon as you get into this, you get into a sort of a stability. And it seems to me that's valuable. All right, I guess I've said enough about it. Yeah, so... <clears throat> So, so, so do look at the, lit, the prop, that paper I recommended, 250. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll uh, <laughs> right, look right. at it and then. <laughs> I should look at that paper. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm having trouble getting that paper published in a sort of a strange way. Maybe I could give you this as another story here. I'm, I'm a person, I'm so well known, you would, might think. Uh, yeah. Submit a paper or everything gets published. Well, of course, every, we, every time we submit a paper, we should have people who look at it very carefully and make a review of this paper because yeah. well, we'll discover some type of typo. Maybe they will discover a make a mistake. There can be mistakes. It's very valuable. And anyway, you could see that you have to how to explain something a little better uh, that you didn't explain. So we need all of that. In this case, I, I submitted this and uh, I got reviews at the end of last April. Two reviews. One is just enthusiastic. And the other one is enthusiastic, except this particular person uh, thinks that uh, there's a mistake in the paper. So oh. I did not, that there were three conditions to show that I had a, that certain, I had a variation, that I had variational uh, uh, convexity, which is essential. There are three conditions that I had verified two of the conditions, but I didn't verify the third condition. The third condition was that a certain function had to be less than a certain other function. And, and, and the referee said, it's impossible to see I, in the paper, it's nowhere shown, it's supposed to be obvious, but it's impossible to see that the second, that the one function is less than or equal to the other function. So the theorem is not proved, but it's actually trivial as I, as I immediately, re, 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 immediately uh, replied and, you know, to, to, to the editor and all those, because this, 
One function was defined by a supremum over a set. The other one was the same formula, but described over a, a, a bigger set. If you take a supremum over a bigger set, you get a higher value than a supremum over a lower set. Okay, now it's going on for six months now. And now this referee says that wherever it is, he or she is trying to find a counterexample. But you're never going to find a counterexample that's a supremum over a, 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 a larger set is higher than a supremum over a smaller set. So it's getting very frustrating to me. Now it's, it's over seven, seven and a half months now since it looked like the paper would be accepted. Anyway, just, this is just, why do I tell this? I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm philosophical about all this. Although I may have to withdraw this paper from the mathematical programming journal and try to submit it elsewhere because this is so, so very frustrating. Uh, <laughs> But this, I'm telling this because there are a lot of young people, and you may have frustrations in publishing things. So even, even I am supposed to be some uh, so well known in this. Even I have frustrations. Yeah. Interesting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> help, help me to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Anybody else who has question, or you just want to open your camera and uh, show up and say hi to Professor Haley? Would you like to show up and say hi? Okay, Hong got the Hong today. Where's the Hong? Yeah, yeah, Hong is there. <laughs> is there? Okay, yeah, <laughs> Professor Rockefeller. Uh, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> yeah. are you on mute? The <laughs> Hong usually likes to be right there at the head of the line. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> so such an important person. So I'm so glad. You know, we're getting to the very last minutes. Yeah. Say another thank you. I, actually, you know, let's not get into politics. But we all know that times are getting difficult. And yeah. really regret is mm -hmm. we we are in a subject which is so international. And we and before the pandemic came, we were traveled and many people in every country studied in some other country. And one of the glories of mathematics is that it's universal, like music. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now, uh, now well, there are more problems. So I, I, I know that, uh, well, there are troubles in China, but then you know that there are people in the, in the West who are being suspicious a lot of Ch Chinese uh, researchers in the West get under suspicion because, well, it's, it's a big subject. I just hope this would all go away. I love the, t the fact when we could all just travel together and it doesn't matter. Yeah, and then there's trouble even with Chinese students coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, there are also, I don't know, there are some reasons this, let me say, but look, look, I hope this all goes away. Let's get back to our world where we can just be excited all together about ideas and enjoy not only the ideas but our personal friendships and company and that can lead to even greater mathematics yeah let's hope that maybe <laughs> next year <laughs> <laughs> yeah hope politics so. aside yes right yeah. mm -hmm. okay well yeah if there's no other questions so Let's call the end for the day and call the end for this series of wonderful lectures. Also, the end of this forum. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, professors. And uh, thank okay. you. And, and thank, thank you, you thank, the thank the organizers. <laughs>